All right, so today we're going to look at Civil 3D sections and section views. Basically, they are cross sections in Civil 3D. They got a different aim, but they are essentially looking at my cross sectional data from my model. So there are some elements that you need to create to access that information. So you use what's called a sample line to control where you want your sections. The section is actually the information extracted from a variety of data sources, terrain models or corridors, typically. Um, section views are actually the mechanism by which you see the actual cross section in the drawing. So you can see it. So it's almost like a little localized inversion of um, model space where the X axis is actually the left and right from your center line. So probably your Y axis and the up and down, which was the Y axis is now your Z axis. Essentially we invert space in just like the section view so that you can see your offset and elevation of your um, data that you're looking in your cross section. And then we annotate that by using combination of labels and what's called data bands. And if some of this is starting to sound familiar to what you've seen in profile views or profiles, that's because they are. The, their nature is almost identical to the way profiles work. Profiles are along your alignment, sample lines um, control it across the alignment and give you your section views for a variety of sections along your model. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody. It's just a slight difference in terminology. Um, what we're gonna look at, there's no explicit agenda. We're just gonna look at the different elements and unpack how you create your sections and section views. So we're gonna look at the sample lines, different data sources, section layouts, different data information you can put underneath in bands, how you label it, how you can project things into your sections, how you can calculate materials and volume tables can be applied to your sections. Now I've mentioned a couple of different terms in here and I thought it'd be nice to give a bit of clarity on terminology. Um, in civil 3D, a certain term might be used, but in Australia, we might use a different language for what that is. So this is a list of the common terms and their equivalent in Australia. So station is change, elevation is level, section is a cross section, section view is a cross section plot, an assembly, which is um, what's used to create a corridor, which is corridors a road and an assembly and subassembly are essentially the pieces that make up the template and are the template itself. And then when it comes to the corridor, there is actually um, a thing in there called the corridor code set, which actually combines things called points, links and shapes. So a point is a design code, a link is like a design segment or a subgrade layer, and then the shape is the subgrade material. So to unpack that last couple of points, I actually grabbed a graphic and I thought I'd show it to you in a graphical sense. So this is a typical corridor section. And the link is essentially the straight line pieces between the points, which are all the blue crosses. So that's your points, which is basically your starting point. So it's like your coordinate geometry of your um, template. The link joins them together. It can be a single link between just two points, which would be something like here for the batter or daylight. Um, the link can also be to enclose a shape. So something like the footpath here is actually created from four code points. And then the links join all of them to form a closed shape. And then when you enclose a shape, you create a shape for essentially a material. So that's basically a lump of concrete or a lump of pavement. That's the terminology that's used in Civil 3D. Um, the interesting thing about code set is it actually is a multi use elements. So it's actually used for assemblies, subassemblies, corridors, section views and sections. So it doesn't live in any of those in settings view. It lives in the multi-purpose stuff. Very top. I'll glance on that in a sec when we jump into Civil 3D. All right. So let's actually go and have a look at what we're going to do. So I thought I'd start by giving some context of what I've set up. So I do have a drawing that has a fair bit of model information already created. So I have started with a simple subdivision and I have created three roads. So originally named as roads one, two, and three. Um, and in that road network, I have created curb returns at all my intersections. And I have also created a cul-de-sac at the end of one of the roads. Now this has all been created using civil site design. Um, and I have also created a couple of pipe networks in civil site design as well. So there's a pipe system sitting here up at the top, just opposite the intersection and the cul-de-sac. Um, and then there's also a more substantial network sitting down near the start 
of the subdivision. So if I flip it to underneath, it might give you a better context. So in here, there's a whole heap of pits and pipes that I've created again using the civil site design pipes um, componentry. And then I am using model viewer now just to show it to you to give you some three dimensional context. So I've done all the design work, got everything the way I want. I just want to create now my production sections or modify, play around with what I'm going to see in my drawing using the civil 3D sections and section views. Um, but I can't just put a civil site design model straight into civil 3D. I've got to use a corridor and a civil 3D pipe network. So I use the civil 3D output controls here to create a corridor of my road network. So that encompasses all of my roads, my curb returns, my cul de sacs, made me one nice co um, corridor of all of it. And I also use the um, export network command to bring out my pipe networks and create them as civil 3D pipe networks. And that's what you're seeing here in the drawings. This is the same drawing, but it's showing the civil 3D elements. Um, let's just push it into orbit and flip it around a bit so you can see what I'm talking about. I have also created a number of surfaces. So once this thing gets me into orbit, there we go. So there's a corridor sitting up the top here, up in three dimensional space, and so is my pipe network. So they're actually three dimensional models that are sitting in my civil 3D drawing. And they're the things I'm gonna start accessing information off. Um, I am going to jump out of orbit and go back, and I'm gonna go back to my good old trusty top-down view. So now I'm back to probably what everyone's more used to in terms of a drawing, just a 2D plan view. Um, I have also taken the liberty of making a few surfaces which we will use throughout the exercise. Um, there is a datum and a total model surface created directly from Civil Site Design exported into Civil 3D. So that represents my top of my design and the bottom of my design. And then I have also made a final surface which is an amalgamation of the natural surface and the uh, total model surface Again, this is used for what I want to show up in the cross section. So that's all of my setup. Um, now let's get into the nuts and bolts of it. So I'm going to actually show you how to create section views in two different ways. Um, and hopefully it'll illustrate the differences between the method. Um, one is essentially ready for production. The other one is in drafting layout. That's essentially a, um, it's a singular decision you need to make at the beginning and I'll, highlight how that works when we get to the layout piece. But the first mechanism I need to put in place is actually these sample lines. So we're going to start off with road two, which is the road that has the cul-de-sac on the end of it. So it runs here sort of, well, not quite east-west, so it runs a little bit north as well. Um, but we're going to start with this one and we're going to create sample lines simply from the uh, home tab. And then on the profiles and section section, there's a button in here for you to create sample lines. This is where you create your sample lines from. So you run the command, it will ask you to pick an alignment. You could choose to pick from a list, but I'm gonna pick it in the drawing. And the first thing it wants to know is what sort of sources of information do you wanna show in these sample lines? Now, this is not something you have to finally decide this point in time, this is just your first uh, go at it, you can add and subtract data sources to your sections at any point in time. So what I want to show in this road to give an illustration to you on one way of doing it is to show my natural surface. I want to use my total model, my datum to get information for our level, cut fill levels. Um, I also want to show the corridor to see the shape of my road model as I look at my sections. So by default, it will assess the drawing and give you every data source it can find. The storm water down here are the two pipe networks. We're gonna put them in later, so I'm gonna turn them off. Definitely want the corridor. These are some surfaces that I'm gonna use for another exercise. So I'm actually turning them off. I really only wanna see my natural, my total model, the top design, my datum and my corridor. And then over here is some ability to control how they look in your sections. So my natural surface, certainly want it to be existing. Total model is actually going to be my design surface. So these styles here are very simple. They are really just line types that are applied. Um, if I actually look into one of these things, you only get to pick basically what the segments and potentially what the points get labeled like in terms of a layer, a color and a line type. That's all they are. Um, so realistically, the differences between existing design and datum is just different colors and line types. Um, so that's design. I wanna come in here and make this one datum. 
And then the corridor, it's a bit more complicated with corridor and how you choose to see them. It comes back to this um, data set that I talked about in terms of um, code sets. And then that code set can be showing the links, the shapes and the points in different ways. So there's quite a number of preset in this drawing. Um, and I'm going to use one of these and then deconstruct this once I've actually got the section view showing the drawing. It'll make more sense to everybody. Uh, so the one I want to use is basic hatched and labels. So I want to see hatching for the shapes and I want to see just the grade labels. So we do that and then click on OK. So that's just my source of information for the sections. I haven't actually created anything yet. That's what this little toolbar is all about. This is about assembling my sample lines in the drawing. So a collection of sample lines are a property of an alignment and they live in what's called a sample line group, which software has automatically made a name for me, SLG01. I can modify the properties of the things in that group. I could add and subtract sources. I can change widths of things. I can edit some of the defaults. I can select a different group if I wanted to work on a different one, if I had multiple groups created in my drawing. Um, and then in terms of the way I create those elements, I have a number of methods to do that. So at the moment it's actually in single station change control. So you can see as I track along my alignment, it will tell me the station I'm currently at. And if I clicked in the drawing, it will create me a section. Great for those um, special points that you may want to do for, you know, where intersections meet or perhaps curb returns join. But I actually want to start with a frequency down my drawing and see where they come out and then modify the suit. So that's this top option here where it says uh, by range of stations. So remember station and chain inch are the same thing. So you click on that one and it will ask you some information about what you want to see. Do you want to start at the end? Do you want to go to the end? Sorry, start at the start, go to the end. If you don't want to and you want a definitive range, you can turn that to false and pick the values you're after. Do I want to control the width by an object, which could be an alignment. If I had an alignment controlling left and right offsets of the property lines, I could use those to make the width vary along my sections. I'm actually just going to use 20 meters to start with. We can play with some of them in a minute. Same for the right side. And then when it comes down to the frequency here, I want to sample it at absolute stations of 10 meters along my straights, tangents, curves, and spirals. Not that there are any spirals in this job. Um, and I want to include start and end, any horizontal geometry points. And if I had any super applied, it would import those as well. So I click on OK and the software will go through and drop in a whole heap of these blue lines. And these are all my section lines that it has pasted through the alignment. Now they look a bit wide, probably shouldn't have gone with 20, maybe you can go something shorter. So that's what these tools are for. So I could have picked the value in the beginning if I knew it, if I don't, that's okay, I can come back and fix it. So I come in here and I go, yep, I actually want to use 15 for the left and 15 for the right. So I click on that and then it'll shrink the widths for me. And then if I wanted to add in a specific change for some reason, uh, maybe I'd be interested in, I don't know, let's put one in here at the uh, center point of the cold sack. Let's try that. So I actually have, that's not a node, oh, no, I don't matter. we'll make a guess. Put it in here and we will say there. And it'll ask me down command line down the bottom here. It's asking me to confirm the widths. So I can say, just use the default 20 and it will place me in a line. And you'll notice that it's longer than the others because I didn't change it to 15. This is the nice thing about section lines. You can actually manually control the widths for every section by manipulating the width of the section line. So if I finish, it will go through and label them for me. So it will use the change value for labeling and it will drop that label in. And I think I've got it anchored to the right-hand side of the section line. But if I grab that section line that I created, that's actually probably what I wanted to see in terms of widths, it might be a touch long. So when you grab a section line, notice a couple of grips. If you grab the end grip here, you can actually manipulate the width on one side or the other. So I can grab it in and I can just make them maybe just the width, just past the um, length of the caudal sac. And perhaps I don't want to see this one anymore because I think you know, I don't really need one part way through the back of the caudal sac. So I can grab the section line, just delete it. Don't need to use it anymore. 
And if I go and look in at the very end, I don't really need to see anything at the very end. It's not going to actually help for any of my views because most of my model doesn't exist at that point. So again, just delete it. And you could do the same thing at the beginning. I seriously doubt you'd want to see a sample line through the zero point because it's just going to show the yellow road. So we'll kill that as well. And then this is the uh, nice bit. I want this section line to actually be where my curve returns are. So you can actually grab this little diamond tracker and wherever you place in the drawing, it will actually allow me to drop it. Now I can also control the location for these things by a specific change. So I could use my normal snaps, so endpoint and stuff like that, but I can also use these things over here, which most people probably turn off. It's called transparent commands. And the one I'm hovering on at the moment is called station offset. I can actually use this to control the specific station of where I wanted to put this particular sample line. So what I do is while I'm in the moving mode, I come over and grab station offset and it'll ask me to pick the alignment. So I grab my alignment in here and I say that I'm going on that alignment. It'll say, what is the station? And if you know the value, it's great. That's why you type it in. So I do know the value of this one. It's 13.011. And then it'll ask me for an offset. I don't want an offset, so I go zero. And then it will shift. Oops, I think I just ran a race because I hit enter. Um, <laughs> it will shift that sample line to the station value that I asked for. So you can manipulate these things and you can actually do these after you've made all the section views and they'll just update with them. All right. Um, that's probably enough on the basics. Now, the one thing I didn't cover and I will cover when I do another section group is you could actually choose to use the sampling from your corridor um, to be the sampling for your sample lines. But to be honest, that'd be way too much information through here. You'd end up getting about a hundred extra sample lines that you probably don't need, but it is something you could potentially use. I'll show you where that one was uh, when I do the next set of sample lines. All right, so that's my first part. Put all my sample lines in the right spot. Now we've got to make the views. So up here, you can make views in either a single view. So you could pick a unique change that you wanted to see and create a section view of just one, or you could make a group of views based off the sample line. Now, I probably should clarify where these things live in the prospect. I did mention it, but I will clarify it now. So I have reorganized some of my alignments, but I am looking for the main alignment running here, which is called road two. And if I expand out road two, the profile is coming from when the corridor was created, but now there is an entry sitting here in sample line groups. And that is actually where the mechanism for the sample line group gets lives because it's part of an alignment. And then if you actually expand out the sample line group, there are all my sample lines. And then these are all the sections that have been created for all the different sample lines. So that is the NS for the various changes, the total model, the datum and the corridor extractions. So this is where all the information comes from. So you can edit stuff from here or in the drawing. But I want to make a whole heap of section views of all of my sections that I've just created. So I come up here and I go create multiple views. It will want me to fill in information like a wizard. So my suggestion is always start on the first tab and use the next after you review the information. So it will automatically work out that I only have one sample line group in the drawing. If not, it will present to me all the alignments that have sample line groups as an option. Um, in this case, I don't need to pick that. It will then ask me what range I'm after. If you leave it on automatic, then it is controlled by the sample line group itself. If you wanted a specific range of values, then you can use the user defined. It will name them all based off the, uh, the station, change and a number, and it will create them all using a view style called road section. We will look at that. As I said, some of these things are better to discuss once we've made them. So I will talk about them a little bit here, but we'll talk about them a little bit more once we've made the objects. This is the big one. So I mentioned that you have to make this decision at the get-go. So how you place these in the drawing is controlled here. And once you do it one way, you can't actually change it to the other. You basically need to kill off the section view group and create it again in the other way. But there are two methods 
there is what's called production. So it will actually allow you to access a drawing template with um, paper space layouts in there that are configured to show you the size of space available for your sections to drop in. So basically get it ready for production or you can draft it in, so place them in drafting mode. So basically it's just a grid of information. So you just get a big grid of all your views. So it's good for design, getting things sorted out. Um, the other one's good for getting your production ready. So I'm gonna start with the drafting for this one. And then when we do the next one, I'll do it in production to show you the difference. Um, in terms of the layout, it's this group plot style controls here. And this actually controls the spacing between the actual views. So that is my spacing. So if you notice, if I hover over here, this arrow highlights, so it helps you to know which one's which, and then this is the vertical spacing. So you can play with these numbers post-production and re-jig the layouts, but this is the starting point that it will use when I drop them in the drawing. Um, range for the offsets, always suggest leave it on automatic, otherwise you lose information. Um, elevation range, same deal, probably best to leave it on automatic unless there's a problem with levels. Sections to display. So these are the sources that I've already asked for. And then there is some configuration on how things are gonna be seen. So I can actually turn them off. So just because I sample them doesn't mean they actually need to be displayed in the section. In this case, I do wanna see them all, but I only want to label the line work off the total model. I don't actually want anything for my natural and I don't want anything for my datum and I don't want anything for my corridor. The style I'm gonna pick, I'm just gonna use this, the basics, but basically we're using the labeling to drop in some leader lines from the design surface to the top of the bands underneath. So basically do my leader extensions. That's what this vertical lines at grade break is all about. Um, you can actually override the style. So whilst the style of the object is defined when we created the sample line group, you can actually override the style in the way it looks in this particular view. Um, in that case, in that vein, I guess, I'm showing the corridor, I'm also showing the top of the surface and the datum, but I don't really wanna show them in the drawing because the corridor shapes have a top and a bottom. So I want them there as information. I just don't want to see them in the drawing. So that's where I'm going to use this override. So I'm actually going to say I want to override and I want a none. There's no none here. So what I'm actually going to do is create a new one just to give you a real quick glimpse on how some of these create. So these styles, as I mentioned, are very simple. They're just basically a line type. So I'm actually just going to create one called none. Oops. That's how it goes to the top of the list. And all I'm displaying is nothing. So it will now use a none style for total model and I will turn on and use none for my datum. All right, next bit I wanna do is add in the data underneath. So this is data bands. So these are the things that sit below my view and contain my information about levels. Uh, it could be design levels, existing levels, offsets, stuff like that. So for this one, I actually wanna label a bit more than just these basics, I actually wanna use full road design. So a combination of bands, so these are all the different bands, is what's called a band set. And that's what you can apply straight away. So this one actually is good because this allows me to give me my level difference. It also allows me to put in a datum value. Um, so you can put in more or less information depending on what sets you've got. So if there's a certain way you wanna see things, set up the set first, which we'll again, talk about the tail end, we'll see what comes out in the drawing. So um, surface one, surface two is just the references for the data labels that get built in the band. So when we've made this template, we've actually been conveniently nice and said which section is used for what. So the premise is normally that surface one is always set as your design and oops, surface two is set as what it is you wanna show information for if it's not the surface one. So in this case, it would be typically NS for most things. Oops. Except for the datum, I actually want to show the datum values in that band, but this band here, I want to just use NS as the secondary reference. And then we go and create the view. So let's go out and dump them out in the drawing. So it'll go through and assemble them. Uh, 
And when... Todd, just while we're waiting. No, oh, not yet. No. Sorry, Gum. Here it <laughs> oh, is. Oh, look, that was <laughs> great timing. Really good timing. Uh, we have had a question about cross-section labels um, yes. on the uh, on the um, on the sample on the section. Well, I wasn't entirely sure because we haven't had confirmation that it is on the sample lines as opposed okay. to it being on the actual cross-section or on the section view. So um, if the person that's asked that question could just clarify, that'd be excellent. But um, if you are going to uh, mention I have a that. suspicion I know what it may be. Is it anything to do with the alignment change labels? Because no, it's, it's not. cross-section slope labels. So cross-section slope sure. labels. Okay, that's code sets, and that comes from the corridor. Yeah, which is what I'm being asked about, I think. So okay. um, I'll do that uh, in a minute. No problem. Thank you. Okay, now you can see in my drawing here, I have a lot of data. And it was deliberate. Um, you can see some sections in here that have got way too many pieces of information. And so the software has done its best to try and crank it based on the scale, but it ain't going to fit. And that's because it's labeling every single gray break on my design surface, which is way more detail than I really need. So this was my fault because when I created these things, I did not use any filtering and I should have. And I should have set them up at the beginning and I deliberately didn't because I wanted to show you what happens when you don't. Um, but it's very easy to fix. So there are two pieces that need to be adjusted. One is these label lines here, which come from the physical gray breakdown to the top of the bands. And then it is the frequency of information shown in the bands. You just need to filter it. So you say every half meter, I don't want a piece of information. The way you adjust it, oops, oh, my drawing's gone bonkers. Oh, there we go. Probably time to give it a good save. Um, you can actually review the content and update all of the sections within the section view. Um, it's called a section view group. So that's the mechanism that now populates over here in the sample line in the um, prospector. There's now a thing called a section view group number one. And that contains all of the sections that you're seeing on the screen right now. Um, and then you can actually access that in a heap of different ways. But when you click on a section view in the drawing, so that's these green squares, which are not plottable, they're just references to show you where the section exists. You can actually come up here and you can go into view the group properties. You can also right click and get to this stuff. And this is where you can manipulate how things are showing up in your sections. So underneath the section here for the change the band set, I can come in here and I can actually say, yeah, my mistake, I should have used a style. And then here, I just want to highlight this. The weeding's already been turned on in some of these. So it's the same styles as the name implies. It's just the weeding values have been implied. I'm actually going to do it backwards. I'm going to make it and I'm going to put them all in at half meter. So this will filter out information. Don't need to do the last one because the last one is actually the heading. So if I apply that. The views will all update and you should get a lot less frequent information showing in your sections. But the labels across the top haven't caught up because they're done as labels. So I actually need to get into the properties and this time I need to go to the section labels for the total model. So I make that a bit bigger. So that's my design surface. I edit these and I say I actually want these things at the half meter break. Click OK, click OK. And then they will now suddenly filter out at the half meters and match up with the label sitting underneath. So now they all match up. So you got to use the filtering and it can be sometimes a, a guess as to what level of filtering you need, depending on the data you've got. Um, but in this one here, half meter works quite nicely for most of the sections I've got. The, if you know in advance, which is a bit hard, how do you know in advance? You pick the style. So sometimes it's a guess and check, very easy to fix. Um, to answer the question about the grade, so you'll notice that, uh, I'll go to a decent section. Got Just to, to confirm, Todd, yeah, it is regarding the these grades labeling here? on cross-section views. Yeah, it was the, yep. the question was basically, um, we have slope labels coming from the corridor code set style, not from the design surface. Correct. So it, which is, I guess, basically ultimately, what's the best practice? Okay. Um, that's cool. So I've deliberately set this one up to come from the code set. Um, so if I actually click on just the corridor in here, I can actually come in here and see the code set style that I've used, which is this case is the hatching. 
and the grade labels. And the way the grade labels have been done, they are links. Remember my graphic early on, links are the connections. And essentially I have said daylights need to be labeled using a slope. Daylight is the batter. So that's one term I didn't put on that list. So there you go. Um, that's these one in twos. And then I have gone for pave, which is my top of my surface. I've done as gray. And that's how these grade labels are coming. Now I've done them because this way because the corridor is very distinct links that I only want to label certain ones. If I wanted to label a surface, yes, you can add labels to a surface. The problem is you don't get as finite control as to where they go. So I can come into the surface and I can go to segments and I can say I want to do grade. I add it in and put it at the bottom. I apply them. So I'm now labeling the natural surface just as an example. But you'll see I get one at every segment along the surface. I can't turn it on and off for certain segments. So I could do that for all the um, design surface if I had it turned on. But that, that's how you label them, but that's the difference. So if you're labeling stuff and you've created a corridor, I would suggest always labeling using the corridor code set because then you get definitive control over which pieces get labeled. You can use weeding on these, but again, it's not a definitive code relationship. Okay, um, what else was I gonna show? Oh, um, I've dropped out all the sections. We've played with the group, the data bands. So I did talk about um, some basics on how this stuff gets built. So um, by no means this is a 101, so I'm not gonna go into the um, ins and outs of how they're built, um, but they are essentially centered on the zero point as the effectively the alignment and then it's offsets left and right and then you can label up based on either definitive increments or grade breaks or um what else is it i can't remember all the other pieces there are a few um i'll go in and show you but i really am not going to deconstruct this at any great level uh, major minor increments center line are the vertices of the um, sample line. So that's basically the start and the end. Um, the great breaks, which is the main one that is used in, at least in all of the examples I'm showing here, it is essentially giving me the great breaks along the surface I'm asking for, which is this example that I'm showing you is the total model. So basically it's going to give me my great changes where the batter starts and the footpath, the curb, pavement, the center line. Um, and then incremental distances if just you wanted it over a definitive value each way. So maybe every one meter or something like that. Um, and then each label type, you actually have to compose a label. So there is one, two, three, four, five, six, just for one band. And then you need to do that for every band you have. Um, I would strongly suggest getting a hold of a template that someone has already done a lot of this on. The Civil Survey Solutions template is the basis for this. I have done some modifications to it. Um, but making these things from scratch is a time consuming exercise. Um, another piece of advice I give on that would be always say in your name of the style, which surface you're actually referencing. Um, in this case here, it's section one minus section two. So whatever is listed as section one is section two is taken away from, but if you reverse that around and you get negative and positive values, so sometimes you need to be careful. So the name is really good place to put in which section you use for information. Um, all right, so let's, I'm going to show you now the dynamic nature of these sections. So let me split the view. So I'm going to show, I'm actually going to play around with the last bit of graphic editing on the section line that I didn't do um, before. Because if you notice when I grabbed this section line to make the widths bigger and smaller, there was actually a square grip on there as well. And the square grip was all about manipulating the position. So you can actually put these things at skew. So if we look at the last one here, which is the 365, you come over here and look at 365, I can actually grab that section line. And instead of grabbing the triangle, which is just stretching the width, grab the square, I can actually change the angle. So I can actually flip that one out to be showing along that part of my cul-de-sac. And then I could grab this side over here and change it to, I don't know, something really stupid. Let's go to that. So you, your section, uh, sorry, sample lines don't actually have to be symmetrical. 
nor do they have to be perpendicular to your alignment. You can actually skew them out if you want. Not sure, maybe in the cobbles they could be useful, but maybe in intersections, but yeah, generally I wouldn't expect you to want to do that often, but you can. Um, so that's that's what those square grips are on the, the sample line. So you can actually manipulate these things and you'll see the section updating as you go. All right, so we've already talked about the corridor labeling. Um, as I said, the label set controls what labels I want to see. It also controls what I want to see for the shapes. Um, let's go to a section over here. So these shapes here I've chosen the color and that comes from that code set. We're going to do the next sample line in a minute and actually look at um, doing a different style for our section, just to basically make it as a wireframe. But before I do that, I need to show you some of the pipe networks. And I also want to show you the um, projection stuff. So I'm no, oh yeah, we're getting short on time. So let me have a look at the pipe networks first. So to add a pipe network, the source is already sitting there. I just need to add it to my groups. So I actually click on one of the sections and up the top here, there's an option that says sample more sources. I come into this and these are the things that I haven't used. I can simply add them in. You don't get any control over the um, pipes beyond a style, which comes from the pipe object itself. But basically once you add them, they will begin to appear in whatever sections they cross. So there will be some in the sections up here for the pipe network that exists at the end. And then there will be a bundle of them in the pipe network that exists up the road here. So let's go and find a section that will have some probably up here. No, no, there you go. we'll go to the start because I know there's some at the start. Um, so we are now looking at probably the first section. Yep. So there's actually a pipe crossing the road here and then there is a pipe running up here. So that's the pipe we're seeing because that other one actually misses the section because I didn't put it right in the middle. Um, the pipe object is controlled by the pipe style itself. So the actual way it looks in section views is controlled by your pipe object style. So you can manipulate that style to see what it looks like in the cross section views. Um, so I've got mine configured here to be nicely showing me the inner and outer and then also to show me a hatch between the inner and outer. So it kind of looks like a solid wall. If I'd actually skewed the angle of the pipe to the sample line, um, then the pipe is actually a true slice. So you would actually see it more like an egg. Um, and if you actually managed to slice it through a pit, you'd see an outline of your pit as well. Um, and they're all controllable, but the, they're always done as a projection. So that's the thing to bear in mind. So it will show you the true shape of the pipe through the section. So uh, I'm not sure the best way to explain that. Um, I guess I could crank this around a bit to show it slicing through the pipe. Yeah, not enough. Let's try this. Yeah, it's hard to pick up, but you can, the pipe's now not actually circular because it's not crossing at 90 degrees. It's actually elongated. Um, because it's a true slice through the pipe. Um, if I want to label that, you actually know label these things using your annotation tools. So it would be pipe network, and then you would go, I want to label the entire network section. And then you want to pick a style. So I've actually made a style. I don't really want to label the structures. And then you click on the pipe and it will label it for you. So I've set up a style on this one just to show me the name of the network the size of the pipe and the obvert level of where the slice happens. If I want to add it up on each one, it is a section by section addition. You need to basically repeat the command on whichever section you want. So there is no mass create, um, but that's how you label up your sections. And then if you make changes to things, all the labels will update automatically. Um, the last thing I want to show you on this group of sections before we jump into the next one is I actually want to label all of the, excuse me, property lines that run up and down the um, either side of the road. So I essentially want a label sitting in here just to mark up my property lines. So I've taken the liberty of drafting a polyline in here. So there's a polyline there and there's probably two others from memory, yep. So these are the polylines I wanna use. 
So what you do is you come into your section views and you go, I want to project objects to multiple views. And it'll say which group. So you just click on one of the sample line groups. And then when you do this, because I'm projecting to multiples, you can project to singular and you pick the view and it'll work out the projection. But because this is detecting objects, it needs to know how far away to look from the sample line. So that's what this graphic at the top's giving you. It's really good. Basically, this is my current sample line and it will take half the distance to the next. We'll go to the current one and we'll go to the previous or to the next. And that's what the percentages across the bottom is. You can actually reduce that. You could actually say, whoops, 25 and 25. So you actually don't care about the bits in the middle. You only care about a quarter of the distance to each one. Or you can actually go all the way up to 100 and you actually get something projected in both. So it's really up to you as to how you want to run it. I would suggest probably 50 is a good start. If you want to do that by definitive distance, you can flip the mode to distance mode and say only 25 meters from a sample line, include that, and that's it. Um, and then what the software has done is gone through and assessed the entire drawing of all objects that are capable of being projected. And there are only these types of objects that can be projected. So your Kogo points, solid blocks, multi-view blocks, 3D polylines, Kogo points, feature lines, and sur survey figures. Basically anything that has a three-dimensional property. Now I've got polylines and I want to use them and I can't because they're not a three-dimensional object. So if I go into the polylines piece here, there's only showing one layer with 3D polylines. So here's a little trick for you. I'll jump out of that. You can actually convert polylines into 3D polylines quite easily. It doesn't have any three-dimensional aspect. It will still have a zero as its level, but then you can use it for your projections and you can use a surface override to set the elevation value. So what you do is you grab your polylines, you go to modify design and you go, I want to convert 2D to 3D. And then when I rerun that section view projection command, notice now that 3D polylines has another layer, which is this Z object, which is the layer I created those polylines on. Then they're suddenly available. And that's actually the one I want to use. I'll turn all the others off because I don't want those. And then over here is the ability for me to control what it's actually going to look like. Um, and I want to, for all three of those things, I want to show them crossing, which is what I'm after. I don't want a marker. I actually want to just label it with a label that has a line drawn inside it. Now I have taken the liberty of setting something up. It's this thing called boundary line. I apply it to all three. Now, if I don't change the elevation option, it will put them in at zero. So my sections will suddenly grow ex ex exponentially in terms of height. But I can override the value and I can say, ignore the value from the object and use my final surface, which is my amalgamation of all my surfaces. And I click on OK, and I click on OK. And then the software will go through and project all of these objects into each section view, wherever that polyline crosses the section view. And if it crosses more than once, you'll get two. So now you'll see that there's markers sitting on both sides of my cross section labeling up where my boundary line sits. And there's that one, and there's that one over there. And because I use my total model plus my natural surface, my final surface model, when it's not on the model, it'll use the natural. And when it is on the model, it'll use my design because that's what that final surface is doing for me. Um, the one tip with that that I did discover is that whatever layer is current is actually the layer these objects are created on. So if you create them and you still got this layer, current layer sitting at zero, they all come on on layer zero. So set the layer first. All right. Uh, let's go and have a look at the other road that I was talking about. I'm going to do that in a different way just to highlight some differences. So I need to flip my view back to single view because I need to see two at the moment. And then we're gonna go through and look at some sample lines and I am gonna go a fair bit quick. I'm not gonna explain everything I'm doing for this one, um, but we're gonna do this road here, but I wanna make these ready for production and I wanna calculate some volumes on this stuff just to do it a little different. So. Our process is the same as before. We need to create some sample lines. I need to grab my alignment. Um, I need to grab some sources. So I need to use existing. I definitely want total model. I'll make that design. I want the datum. Oops. 
datum, we shall make datum, datum. Don't want final, don't want the island restores. I want the corridor, don't want the stormwater because it's not in that area. I want the corridor to be basically nothing in terms of labels, sorry, in terms of hatching. So it's no hatch, but I want it to label offset and level for me because I'm going to use the corridor to do that information and the bands, I'm only going to label the natural. So click on OK. Um, that's it for the sources. In terms of locations, I am going to, so I mentioned there was a couple other ways you can build things. You can say here from corridor stations, which would give me way too many samplings, but that's what that would do. Give me wherever there's a blue um, corridor sample line. I can pick points on the screen randomly, or I could actually use existing polylines. So you can actually pre-draft all this if you wanted to. Um, I'm actually going to go by range because I'm just going to be lazy. Um, but I am going to make it, make them 10 meters wide because it's a pretty narrow road. Start and end, bang. And I'm going to kill the end one because again, I really should probably not just build it. I find it easier to just delete afterwards. Um, and probably don't want 80 either. It's in the middle of the intersection. But I do want 70, but I want 70 to be for my Kerpertune connections. And you'll notice 70 is a bit short. So if I grab that, I'll just make it a bit longer. And then at the other end, um, we can get rid of zero and, oops, can grab the sample line. Tens down here, I'm not reading the right bit. Let's just put it up here because I don't really care, but it probably should line up to my tangent point, my curve return. Um, let's go make the views. So I'll go make multiple. Um, it's picking the first road, so it's got to make sure I pick the right road. So it's road three, sample line group two, that's all good. Um, these sections here, actually, I didn't talk about this. I might talk about it now. So if I Make a copy of this thing. The section view is actually where you control the vertical exaggeration. And the graph was we were looking at previously was all one to one. I can actually change this thing to being say one to two. Uh, I might screw up my tables, but anyway, we'll see how it goes. Um, section placement. So this time I'm going to use production. And basically you can access a template file. So this is my metric templates from Civil 3D. So one of these in the plan production section, um, and it is here you go, section sheets for metric there. I could perhaps grab the ANZ one if you've got the ANZ country kit installed. Um, and then it will assess that template for views that have layouts created of certain sizes. So name them efficiently so you can recognize what they are. Um, I want A1s at one to 500. So I'm gonna pick that one and it'll use that layout as a, frame to assemble my sections so that I've got them ready to go for production. It'll still group them up based on the grids that I had before. So we'll use that offset range, leave it, leave it. Sections to display, um, we leave all them, but we want the vertical lines on the natural because that's really the only one I care about. We'll go 0.5, uh, that will do. And then we will go and pick road design as our type, but we want half meter weeding. So we want the weeding already. Um, and our surface references, I actually want NS as the reference for everything. And I'm gonna change the bands around, but I'm gonna do that after I've created, because I really don't want design, but I hadn't made a band set to do it. So I'm gonna do it this way and also to illustrate how it works. So now I pick a new location and it will lay them out but it will use the extremities that it's found in that drawing templates layout as a limit. So that's what the yellow and green lines are. The green is the outline of the page. The yellow is the outline of the viewport that's created on that layout. And so to use that as the extremities to fit everything into the drawing. And you can see that the section views are actually now exaggerated vertically because I changed that style to be two to one rather than one to one. It has also labeled all of my code points. So this is the code set again, labeling information. Um, although I think I might've forgot to put slopes on, probably should have put slopes on. Um, so we can fix that. 
So we can come to this and go to the section group properties. And I really should have picked that one. So we'll fix that. So now I've got my grades as well. Um, so remember, it's the code set combination that actually gives you what is and isn't labeled. So these are the links and shapes. So the points are labeled using this style here, which is offset and elevation, elevation only for the center. And then the grade stuff is coming from the link. So there's only certain links that have been labeled again. So that's how I'm controlling what is and isn't labeled in my section view for my corridor object. All right. Um, let's change the data bands on this thing. As I said, I don't like what I've put in here. I've got it partly what I want, but I need to make Oh, oops, wrong one. This one, this actually we'll use that in a minute. Um, if you ever think that the views aren't sitting where you want, you can actually use the update layout and it'll force it to rebuild the layouts if you've made changes to vertical exaggeration or something. Um, what I actually want to modify is the band sets here. I don't want design, so I actually kill it off. And I'm now showing existing level two. And this stagger is the, um, the shift left and right. So the first one has to have a value, otherwise it doesn't shift. But I actually want to use existing level. I want to change it to use another version of that existing level, but using section one as my reference. So it will pull all the location information off from whatever set in surface one. Uh, that's all I want to do on that. So I do that. And you see how everything shrinks. And this is when the update group comes in handy because you can force if the layout isn't the way you expect, you can force the layout to fix. So I can actually move these things around. So if I accidentally move it, I can actually come back to the group and I can go update layout and it will reconfigure the layout based on the settings for that group. All right, so now I'm really just showing existing and offset on the bottom and all my design information is on the top. Um, now I wanna show some volumes. So. We need to look at how you compute the volumes and then how you display the volumes. So you can do the volumes in two ways. You can do your bulk cut and, earth work, cut and fill earthworks, get it out right. Um, but you can also compute materials based off the corridor shapes if you've got them set up. So we're gonna have a look at both of those. So let's uh, go into the computational command. So you gotta pick the alignment. And then you come up here and, oh, so I picked the alignment, sorry, my mistake. Pick the section and you go compute materials. It's probably the easiest way to get to it. Um, and you make sure you pick the road you want. So road three. And then in here, there is some quantity takeoffs. Um, and it will default to probably the cut and fill criteria, depending on your template setup. Um, if you are using the civil survey solutions template, I'll give you a warning now, the information and the um, criteria is backwards and fill is cut and cut is fill. Um, I've reversed it in this one, but be wary that you may be getting the numbers backwards. Um, basically, you can define what is the ground surface. So my ground surface is natural. So that is the ground for my cut and fill. And my datum surface, which is what I want to compute my volumes to, is my datum surface. Pretty straightforward. Click on OK. And it will actually go in and annotate my sections for me with some hatching. Now that hatching comes from the style, which I didn't talk about in the computation. So in here, in that criteria, it actually has got some shape styles here set as cut material. This is a very straightforward style that basically has an outline and an area fill. And then the area fill can be a hatch, which is exactly how we've done it. And we've been very original and used red for our cut and green for our fill. So that's my bulk earthwork type information. But if I wanna add in information related to the materials, then the way you do that is you add in another material you can give the thing a name, so make it a bit more obvious and set pavement. And in terms of the type, you actually switch it to what's called structure. And then up the top here for the source of information, you say, I want to pull a corridor shape. So remember the shapes of the colored pieces in our um, example in the picture at the very beginning. I want to add in pavement. I want to add in pave two. 
I want to add in base and I want to add in sub base. And I want this thing to show up in my drawing using my pave style, just so I can see what I've done. So if I apply that, you can see now that all of the pavement pieces have shown up. And if I was being really nice, I probably should have broken that up into asphalt granular material, but I'm just illustrating a point. So let's just say that's the bulk information for pavement. And then we could come in and do another one for concrete. Um, same process, we change it to structure. We flip it out to a different style. So let's maybe use curb. And this time we will add in curb and sidewalk and we apply those. So they color up in my drawing. Now, the reason I colored them was one so that I could understand that I've included certain shapes and certain types. But in reality, I don't want them to show up in the drawing as a colored shape at all. What I actually can do is go to my group properties and in the sections, I can say that I want to override pavement to be none. And I want to override the concrete to be none. And so they will still be computed. They just won't show up in here, but they are still that style for the group overall, just override in this particular view group. Okay. And then what I want to do now is add in some tables of information about all that volume that I've just calculated. So I come in here to my materials group. So I might go back and just repeat that. So when I'm in the section group properties, um, the section views here are listed and this is where you can manipulate the information for the bands, but there's also one in here about the volume. So once you've computed materials for a view group or for a sample line group, sorry, um, you can then add in that information as a table for each section. So that's what you click here and you say, I want to add in the total volume for cumulative earthworks. I want to add that in and it will use information in that material list which is the only material list I've got. But I also want to add in a material calculation for my table, add that in. I don't really want it for the bulk earthworks, which is the cut and the fill. I just want it for the pavement and the concrete. I don't want it 41 millimeters apart, let's go five millimeters. And then underneath here, it will assemble these to the right of my view. That's what this picture over here is telling me. I actually want to set them above. So I actually say I want to put the orientation to the top center and the anchor, anchor for the table is the bottom center. So they're now sitting above, but I need a Y offset or something. So let's push them up, say 35 millimeters. So now it will separate the two. So if I click on OK and then I click on OK, it'll drop in a whole lot of tables. Everything will look weird and wonderful and wrong. This is where my synchronize of my view groups comes from. So you go update view group layout and it still doesn't look right. So you press it again and ah, because I've got the vertical exaggeration on two, I was expecting another one to sit at the top here. So I can play with that separation if I really wanted to. Sorry, when I was mucking around with this previously, I was using a one-to-one -one exaggeration. Um, we can flip this out. Maybe we'll make this 25. Should force them to fit. No, still running out of space before it hits the top. Um, yeah, that's just my bad layout. Um, <laughs> the other trick I could do is reduce the scale on the um, viewport style. We can flip the sections. Yeah. Um, them back to that. That'll force them to fit. There we go. That's what I was expecting. Um, so it fits them all up in between each other. So in each of those tables, it will compute the area of the cut and fill and give me the cumulative value. So the first one's not going to have a lot. But if I start looking at the next one, it will tell me, yep, this thing's got a heap of fill. And it's cumulative value. Yep, there you go. I'm just filling everything, which makes sense because I'm seeing lots of green. But when I start getting into these sections in here, this one's all in cut, but my cumulative values are starting to drop in my net. So I'm actually pretty balanced to this point. But if I look at the last one, I know I'm way out. 
Uh, this one's got a significant amount of cut and my net volume balance is way off. Um, the material information sitting over here. So this is just the material for the pavement and the concrete. So it will add them up for me and give me my net and the cumulative value sitting at the bottom. So that's for the pavement, that's for the concrete. All right, there's one last thing I want to show you, which was a singular projection of something. Um, and then I am happy to open it up for questions. So if there are any questions while I set this up, JT, I can answer them now. Yeah, uh, no, other than the question we had earlier about the, the labels, uh, slopes, yeah. Yep. Um, yep. Which, so yep, it's either well, all I'm... the surface or the corridor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, uh, other than that, no other questions. So yeah, guys, okay. we, we are coming to the end of the session. So if you do have anything, please feel free to pop it into the Q&A panel. Thank you. Sure. So what I want to show you now is instead of projecting, I'm going to project it just the one viewport, uh, sorry, one section view just to show you, but instead of projecting a um, line or an object, I'm actually going to use a block. Um, and what I want to illustrate is actually, let's change 40. So let's have a look at this one. And then actually this is something I should show you. This is pretty cool. So if I am trying to find my sections and section views, um, you can actually go and find them from the prospector. So I want to find while I'm in this viewport over here, this section view itself. So I go to my section view group and I go, I want to find change 40 and you go zoom to, and it'll take me straight to that section view. And then if this half of the screen, I want to find the actual sample line. I want to find the sample line for change 40 and I go zoom to. So the zoom to on the, um, the prospector is actually really handy for finding your section views and your section lines. All right. What I want to project is this overly simplified light pole block that I've got sitting here in a drawing. Now this block is nothing spectacular. It is just a plain Jane two-dimensional block that it actually is probably inserted at elevation of zero. So if I used its real elevation in the drawing, it would probably like the other one, give me really weird looking information. But I want to project this into this section. So the way I do that, is section views, but this time I go project objects to section view. The command line down the bottom here, whoops, keeps will be my prompt. So it's telling me I need to pick the object. So I want to pick that. And then it'll ask me, uh, whoops, I pressed the enter too many times then. Apologize for that. Let's try that again. <laughs> pick the object and then it'll say pick the uh, view. So I jump across over to here and then it'll pop me up into the projection information. Now, Blocks can be projected in two ways. It can actually be projected as what's called a crossing or a projection. So a crossing is only when the block physically crosses the section line or sorry, the sample line in the section view, um, you can control what it looks like. Projection will basically take it from wherever it is and project it across to the section. And that's actually the one I wanna use in this case. I don't wanna show where it's crossing. I want to use the projection. I I'm going to set the projection style to standard. I want to show you what happens with that. I don't want to label it because I really just want to see this. I don't really want to know the information, but I could if I wanted to. And I am going to change the elevation control. I'm going to say, take it from the total model. So it'll take it from my design surface. So I click on OK. And what it does is it takes the block and it projects it, but it uses the block as the projection in the section view which is not what I want. Um, if I had a multi-view block, then this would actually work out that the, the other view was the one I wanted to use, but that's not what I've set up. What I actually want to do is I want a different block when it's projected in this view. So I click on the projection and I go to the properties of the projection. And I have taken the liberty of setting this up, but the standard style for these things is to simply, when it's a block, use the block. I actually went in and I made a new one and I called it light pole. And in light pole, I said, when I'm using a block, I want you to, instead of using the object as drawn, which is what the previous one did, I actually want you to use a different block altogether, which is this block here, which is, looks like much more fancy light pole. And that's what's gonna happen now. So that block will then suddenly appear as that different view in the section view for me. And then the nice bit is it is dynamic so I can grab the block and move around. Now you'll notice the levels actually change there because remember it's a projection. 
it's taking the level from wherever this block physically sits in the drawing and projecting it across. If there's a slope or a crossfall involved, any level difference, it is going to show up differently. Um, you either, I mean, that's the true projection. That's why I've made it dashed, make it look like it's a projection from behind. Um, if you're really finical about it and you did want it to be in the right spot, you can actually manually override the thing and push it up and it'll say, do you want to allow you to do that? And then we'll use that level. So it is up to you how you want to manage that. Um, but that's how you project singular objects. And if I'd done the multi object projection and use that distance, then this would have been caught up in this one. But then any other block that existed, if it was the same block in the drawing, which keeps zooming out the wrong thing. Um, so if I had multiple ones of these on here, it would project into the nearest section, depending on what I configured. But that is the, um, that's all the things I wanted to show you in the section views and section um, production. The, it certainly is a, a whirlwind of it and it is a one-on-one. -on -one, so I'm only covering all, not, all the basics. I haven't delved into the setting up of much of the styles. I sort of touched on some of it. Um, just to cap that bit off, I mentioned that code sets is a multi-purpose thing. So from a style perspective, where you would go to create or edit this information, in the settings tab, multi-purpose stuff lives up the top under general, and it would be uh, under here, it is the code set style. So that is where those are defined because they're used by multiple objects. The section view and section view, sorry, section styles all come under their own sections here. So they're pretty straightforward to find. The pipe stuff that I was setting up or showing came from actually the pipe object itself. So it is the pipe styles. Um, so there are pipes shown in different ways in here. Um, so that's where you actually configure how the, the sections show the pipes. Um, and then the volume and quantity information comes from the quantity takeoff section. So the criteria definitions all come from this quantity takeoff criteria. And then the table styles, if you wanted to manipulate those come from this part of the world. All right. That is everything I wanted to show, JT. Is there uh, any questions? Yeah, we've literally just had one more question just pop in uh, the 11th perfect, hour. So we may, or may, yeah, we may or may not be able to answer this one okay. in this particular session, but um, is there a way to create sample line groups to include all horizontal and vertical geometry points, i.e. The, the TPs, the middle of an arc, um, et cetera? These guys are still doing it by single sample lines and manually putting the stations of the geometry in. Um, is that something we can answer in this session or, or potentially something offline? So say it again, I just want to make sure I understand the question correctly. Create sample line groups to include all horizontal and vertical geometry points. Yeah. So for one alignment or for multiple alignments, I guess is the question. Well, I, the I sample line groups live in one alignment, so it's alignment property. Well, it'll, be, it'll be alignment to alignment, I guess, is yep. what the question is, yeah. Yes, so when you make the sample line group, um, no, I've got to remember how to edit these things. Let's go back and we go sample lines. So there is different, different ways to create the um, sample lines. So when you do it by station range, I asked for horizontal and geometry points? Oh, you mean the vertical profile geometry points? Yeah, um, I, I, yeah. I don't think you can do them automatically. You'd have to do them manually. So that yeah, would be, what doing. yeah, pretty sure. Oh, actually, if you, oh, that's where the corridor one might be useful because you could rip them off the corridor and then delete the ones you don't want because the corridor would have all the sample points, depending on how you configured it, mm. at the right points. That's one way of doing it. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's a way to specifically pick the profile points because the, yeah, it didn't give me an option for profiles there at all. No. No, it's okay. no, not to my knowledge. I might do a bit of digging around and if I find out anything else, we can let you know, but I don't think so. I think it is a manual process, but no, fantastic. the corridor, as I said, ripping the corridor sections off and then deleting the ones that are irrelevant might be a faster way because it will bring in every single one that's the blue line on the corridor shape there which yeah. should encompass all of my profile points plus extras. You delete all the extras and you've still got them left behind. Okay, yeah. so it's, a, it's a Rob Peter to pay Paul one. Mm. Okay. Fair enough. Thanks, Todd. Thanks for that answer. And again, thank you uh, for the questions. Um, I think we might end the session there. I'll just stop the share if that's okay, Todd. Yep. No, you can steal away. Well, folks, look, this is the last one of the year. 
Um, thanks, Todd, for uh, for that uh, great bookend to um, what is a, a great basically playlist now of civil site, uh, civil site, civil 3D webcasts. Um, I am going to very quickly just on the chat for those of you that are interested. And now I can't see the chat, which is kind of frustrating. Um, I was going to put a link to the uh, YouTube channel, specifically the civil 3D playlist, which covers a lot of stuff that um, Todd has kind of mentioned in passing during this webcast, such as styles um, and corridors, etc. There are dedicated webcasts and including profiles in fact um, to those particular aspects of civil 3d so have a look at the youtube channel and have a look on our um, main page uh, the civil 3d playlist thank you very much for your attendance for this webcast and for those of you that have attended throughout the year um, i think a lot of us are looking forward to seeing the back end of this particular year um, and uh, yeah we hope you have a fantastic christmas and and break and we'll be kicking off probably i expect in february next year uh, with a new um, series of webcasts and uh, so keep your eyes peeled on the uh, the website youtube channel and also if you'd like to um, get the webcast mailing to uh, to let you know basically what's coming up um, go ahead and subscribe at the following link here thanks again todd no worries thank you jt pleasure no and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you all next year have a great break thank you yep. merry christmas everyone <laughs>